that takes us to our, our next presenter, who is well known to people at this conference, uh, Dr. Gordon McGurk. And Gordon is talking in this session, and I'll go straight on to it so he doesn't lose any time. Um, Human Research Ethics Committee process, striving for efficiency in a world of rules. Over to you, Gordon. Thank you, thank you Andrew. Um, can I just check you can see the screen? Because um, if not... Yep, it's very clear. Oh, thank you very much. Good. Well, um, let me start by saying, and uh, not, not to get one up, one up on Lindsay there, may I start by saying Yura Ngiri, which means in the language of the Jandai people from Stradbrook Island, welcome. So welcome to the conference. Um, I hope you have enjoyed that. That was a wonderful talk and very important that we um, uh, compare, I, th I think, research involving Maori with our own research involving uh, in, uh, First Nations peoples. And for those that are going to be here tomorrow morning, Marie Toombs from University of Queensland will be talking about this. So what I thought I would do is, um, you know, <laughs> I guess talk about quality and efficiency and um, you know coming from where I did from the NHMRC and of course we looked at things from another side of a fence and um, it's all about numbers and what I really wanted to say as, as an opening thesis is it's not really just about the numbers because the time is fine and we all strive to get within the 60 days etc but taking a point just from Lindsay's uh, comments there one a question I didn't get to ask him um, it sounds like for example that Maori really are a community and that, that are involved in the development of research. And in that sense, pretty much research in this country should all involve the community for whom the research is aimed at, right? No brainer sort of thing, asked Ian Freckleton yesterday. He had a different view of the world, doesn't really matter. Um, but I think also taking a point from Tanya Simons, we can reinvent things, we can reimagine things. The only barrier to that is, is kind of ourselves. So starting with some principles that, the, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it's not a COVID cough. I still have my sense of taste. I still have my sense of smell and somewhat of a sense of humor. The primary function of an ethics committee, as we know, protection of the participant, right? That's a no brainer. That, that's what we do. It's our bread and butter. Everything is geared towards that. The other thing I wanted to point out though, is I believe HREX are service providers. I know that all members uh, give their time freely and voluntarily and they may get the, the random gift token at Christmas time or, you know, the sushi rolls in the evening. But at its greatest level, we are there to provide a service, so research or facilitate research. Okay, we have to do our best holistically so that this can occur and we can't get away from that. And if we don't do that, then researchers probably have a right to say to the institution, why aren't things happening quicker? Third thing is the national statement provides guidance, but there's more required. And we heard Tanya talking yesterday, I think, about the development of certain ways of doing things, followed by its codification uh, in, in legislation or, or guidelines. And I think what this, in my view, means is that sometimes we have to lead the way. We can't always be followers. We can't always wait till our respective jurisdictions write something and, and uh, tell us to do it. We can actually lead the way. So the national statement is fantastic, but you know what, holistically and, um, and teleologically, rather than deontologically, there's more out there. We can look at the end as opposed to just the rules inside. So an important uh, distinction, and I think what that means is we can actually look outside what we do as well. Now, a couple of papers here I thought is really interesting. Ethics and governance under fire. And one of them was from uh, last week's Australian Health Review Oh, actually last month's Australian Health Review. And this was about challenges in obtaining research ethics and governance in a multi-site audit study. Now, we've all been there. And on the right there, we have one published by Gary Allen as uh, Arex, a call for national inquiry into the burden of research ethics and governance. Now, of course, ethics and governance are conflated. And I didn't have a chance to look online to see how many governance people were there. So I don't I know I don't intend to offend anyone. I certainly wouldn't try to, but we have to recognize that uh, these are always conflated. Ethics and governance are always conflated wrongly. You know, uh, I'm going to show you that, that ethics times can be pretty, pretty low, but I'm not suggesting for a second that there's an issue with governance. What I am suggesting is that we can transform things. We can reimagine it and do it in a different way, because if we don't, then we'll, we'll, we'll get what we always got. And we all know, and those who deal in governance, and Rebecca, I'm sure you're online, and you'll know with your backlog of, of contracts or whatever, it becomes painful. And in a hospital such as the Royal, where we have 
500 applications per year, that's significant. So there, there is a bit of an issue here, conflation of ethics and governance. And we heard, um, we heard Brent Richards this morning talking about um, ethics and governance and again, conflating the two. So I think it's important just to differentiate for the purpose of this talk. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Um, these are the national mutual acceptance uh, standard principles of operation. And as you can see, it says apply a 60 day calendar mark, calendar day benchmark for scientific and ethical review uh, and decision making. Now, there's very little way you cannot make 60 days. Uh, I mean, really, um, uh, if someone takes a few months to, to come back to you with answers, clearly that's going to blow at the time. But if you use the clock stop, it's very unlikely you're not going to pass the 60 days. So to be honest, it's a pretty generous benchmark. And I believe we should actually be trying to aim slightly lower than that, in actual fact, a lot lower than that. Um, because again, otherwise, we, we are seen as being a barrier. And I think we can be more efficient than that. I don't think we're a barrier, but we're seen as that. So I well, just wanted to talk about um, the characteristics of ethics committees and why, um, I guess, what, what we sort of should be looking at. And we know that ethics committees comprise um, seven or so categories, um, and that the decision-making process is facilitated by the exchange of discussion between these groups. Right? So it's wonderful if you have lots of members, you get lots of discussion. I, I'm sure I empathize with many of my colleagues online who have had to conduct ethics committee meetings online through the COVID era. I'm pleased to say we are actually back now face-to-face although we're only allowed 15 in a room. Um, but sometimes doing it online was, was actually difficult because you can't see non-verbal cues. You know people want to say something, but you can't see it. So face-to-face -face is wonderful. And only then do you get that exchange of information. The decisions that come out of an ethics committee are based on the quality of the discussion and, and the decision-making. I, as a chair and other chairs online, will, of course, try to corral all of these discussions into a way forward. And... Um, they can also engender the quality of the of the discussion. Uh, I'm pleased to say that I, I don't really like any, any ethics meeting going more, more than three hours and uh, less is more. And to my Townsville colleagues, you're wonderful. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a member on there as well, by the way, and sometimes their meetings are particularly short. Sometimes that's because there are less applications that we have. And I'm sure Scott Campbell, if he's online, will understand that Metro South um, has a significant number of applications and so takes more time. We always try and engender a patient-centered approach, but realistically, how do we manage that uh, in an ethics committee? I would contend it's not possible, irrespective of what Ian Freckleton may have opined yesterday, insofar as he believed that an ethics committee comprised a sufficient number of people to be able to give you that patient-centered approach. I don't actually agree with that. I think we need an external perspective, and I'm fairly sure Gary Allen will, will probably back me up on this one. Should we be considering translation and implementation? Yes, I believe we should. What's the point of doing research if it's not able to be implemented in, in a health system? Because ultimately we're there to improve a health system. So there are some characteristics of ethics committees I think we should be taking into account. Now, it is true to say that not all ethics committees are created equal. Even if you're certified by the NHMRC, ethics committees are different. One committee may come up with a slightly different decision than the other one. Sometimes um, they come up with the same decision by going via a slightly circuitous route. But the question is, how do we engender consistency? And that's not easy. And of course, one of the purposes of this meeting is to try and engender some consistency. So I think that's fundamentally, we have to recognize that not all ethics committees are equal. One, because of size, um, um, well, let's just say size, size is very important. Um, and we're quite lucky at the Royal because we have a rather large ethics committee and therefore we have a wide variety of expertise. So how can we decrease time and add value to the process? As I say, it's not all about the time and, and the value is, is important. So just to give you a background of, of the Royal Committee, 38 members, I never say no to new members. Um, I think that there's always a place for... Uh, you know, for, for, for their views. They may or may not stay long. We have, we don't have a high turnover, but we do have a turnover. And I think that's incredibly healthy. Um, but clearly, uh, if we were to look at certain kind of studies, early phase clinical trials, it would be handy to have um, you know, people with expertise in, in, in clinical trials, plus uh, say for CAR T cells, um, an immunologist. 
So we're, we're lucky we have that. What we do, and um, to some extent, I've copied this one from Townsville, is half are rostered on one month, half the next month. And what that means is even if we have a large application load um, and I don't have to give it to, to all of that half, I can actually call in some from the other half. But what it does mean is that they get a break. Uh, but those that aren't on that roster are on the low risk applications. Um, I'm also quite lucky because I have about 15 or 20 hospital clinicians that are actually are used as low risk uh, reviewers. So we don't have a non HREC level of review, but what we do is we use ethics committee members and clinicians as part of that low risk review, but we also inter intercalate that with uh, the rostering. So, so far this year, as you can see, we've had a shed load of applications, um, but I want to put this in a context where I'm only 0.4. Now, I've managed to um, get another day, which is wonderful, but, you know, two days a week is not really enough. And I'm fairly sure most people online, most chairs online would probably agree with that. For that level of, uh, of, of, of um, uh, that volume of, of work, it, it's significant. Now, what I want to talk about is just the evolution of uh, a review process. So it's not quite Vitruvian man, but it's, a uh, you know, um, I, I should acknowledge where the slide came from, but I can't actually remember. Um, I think what, what this is trying to say is it's a product of evolutionary forces because we start at one end and now we end up at the other end by virtue sometimes of, of luck, by virtue sometimes of, in this case, COVID-19. So what I wanted to call it is uh, several phases. First phase was a business as usual Jurassic phase in which uh, we, we do what we always did. We get applications in, give them to reviewers, reviewers come to the meeting, uh, and then the questions are collated and sent out. Next phase we moved on to was sending questions early. So the reviewers would review the applications, we'd send the uh, questions to the um, researcher, and uh, then we consider them at the meeting. In COVID, of course, we had to change our, our, our modus operandi, and I'm fairly sure all ethics committees did because for one reason or another, some research would have been stopped in favor of just COVID research. We were lucky, we kept all research going, but we did prioritize COVID research. So I will show you about seven studies uh, that were prioritized as a result of COVID. And um, as a result of that, it can make a big difference. But in what we did with COVID, and certainly one application that we had, which was for one of the hydroxychloroquine trials, um, we held a meeting with, uh, with the researcher, and essentially that was done over two days. Okay, it was done over a weekend, got the application on the Friday, held the meeting, approved on the Monday. We move into the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment is now where we want to be. This is where we receive the, allocate, the application as quickly as possible, allocate as quick, sorry, receive it, allocate as quickly as possible, review within, say, five days, and then approve out of session. So we don't have to wait till the meeting. We can approve out of session, ratify the meeting. And what this means is if someone submits an application straight after closing day, we can go, what the heck, we'll just do this one out of session, and we can still have the result, you know, very, very quickly. And I suppose this can, it can be done by virtue of the fact we have a lot, of, a lot of members. But as I say, it's just a process of evolution. So the last phase, and one we haven't quite got to yet, but we're considering is the reward, the possible monetization of efficiency. Could we sell ourselves as a site that managed to get um, applications done in a short space of time? Now, this is nothing different from what um, um, St. Vincent's in Melbourne do with their valet service. But of course, uh, I, don't, I don't know whether they pay their members. This might be contentious because I, it was my suggestion that we might consider paying members to do this because members are voluntary and if they're going to do this in their uh, spare time, why wouldn't we pay them? So that's slightly contentious. We haven't got there yet, but it seems like that might be a natural progression. So just something to think about. And by the way, I'm not saying this is perfect, and I'm sure some ethics committees online are probably doing something like this. But I just wanted to show you this and some figures just to let you know where it's going for us and then how we move forward. So if you look on the, the February, the phase one, and I'm sorry the, um, the graphs aren't, aren't huge. My Excel skills have deteriorated over the years. What I do want you to look at, though, is, is that there are 14 applications in February. The average um, clock days was 31.9 average business days. That is the time it was spent between you know, me allocating it, it being reviewed, and then reviewers considering responses, 16.9 days. Then we move on to phase two, and this is where we start sending the questions earlier. And you can see there that immediately we have less clock days, 
and uh, uh, less business days. So an average of 12.9, which is pretty damn good, actually, although only eight applications. So for those Stato geeks out there, um, you know, tell me whether or not that's, that's, uh, that's um, uh, appropriate. Then we got into COVID, and then this came out. The UK approves a clinical trial of coronavirus within 10 days. So the recovery, recovery trial received ethical and regulatory approval in nine days, compared with a standard 30 to 60 days, blah, blah. You can read the rest. Really impressive. And I thought, well, hang on. If they can do that, why can't we do that? Well, as it turned out, during May, we had seven studies, um, two of which were the clinical trials, one with hydroxychloroquine, one with remdesivir. And you can see that the hydroxychloroquine study was approved. It came in. We had the meeting with the researcher. It was approved within two days. Now, it didn't it didn't actually start for uh, for political reasons um and of course i'm not, i don't have any um uh, governance uh data on there but that's not really the point in this case the point is that through a process um which was i, I guess uh happened as a result of covid we were forced into a situation where we wanted to be responsive and responsiveness in this case was two days for the remdesivir trial slightly more 7.7 .7 days and this is because they were they were actually waiting to find out information from the sponsor about whether or not uh, they could use the drug in a certain way. So that's why there's a difference there between the average clock days and, and the business days. But you can also see in number two there, that was a three days. That took us three days to do for another, uh, another COVID uh, application. And I take my hat off to the committee because they, you know, as soon as the applications were sent, the responses came back remarkably quickly. So I think... This, this showed me that, of course, in these situations, you know, no such thing as a barrier. It's just an opportunity to do better. And that was really impressive. So what next? As I said, we talk about the enlightenment, receive, allocate, review, and approve as soon as possible. And then uh, with the, monetar the possible monetization. Um, I've already talked about that, so I won't talk about that next. So let's talk about adding quality. And then what about infrastructure? Now, I won't talk too much about infrastructure, at least in one sense. I won't talk about the data capability because we are only as good as our, our, our um, electronic data management systems. And without being contentious, if they don't support the ethics committee in the way they should, it does make things difficult. I know we labor under doing or having many spreadsheets, so that makes life difficult. I think we would all want a system that, that made things easier as opposed to not, right? So we'll leave the infrastructure there, but let's talk about adding quality and then we'll talk about a bit of infrastructure because it's not just about the time. Our job as an ethics committee is to add value and add quality. It's not just to be quick. We have to do the right thing. If it takes an hour to assess an application at a meeting, it takes an hour. It means we're gonna have a long night. Now. How do we enhance quality on the Royal Ethics Committee? Well, first of all, we have tried to have the right skills. When I started, I did, a, I did a skills matrix. And what I'm trying to achieve by the skills matrix is look at the expertise of all the members. And I want to know that I have at least three or four people in each category, be they phase one trials, phase two trials, data linkage, um, uh, I don't know, paediatric research, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research. I want to know I have all that expertise at my fingertips so that I can actually allocate applications because then that gives me redundancy. It allows me to have half the, half the team off, half the members off at any one time. So that was quite important. So I think one, one thing I would suggest if you haven't done that is look at your ethics committees, look at your members, see what their expertises are and where your gaps are. Now, I don't know if the NHMRC is still certifying in any categories um, but irrespective of whether it is or not, that won't stop us doing um, the, the research we have to do and getting the, the expertise because I would not want to be a committee that wasn't able to review applications involving Aboriginal or uh, First Nations people and or paediatric research. And of course, the national statement says you have to have the expertise or have access to. So we, we either have it or we have access to it. In a way, it doesn't matter what the NHMRC certify in we will make sure we have that expertise so that anyone that comes to us and says, I want to do this research, we can say, yes, we can review it. Another thing we do with new people, and I'm sure others do this as well, so I'm, not, I'm trying not to tell you how to suck eggs. I'm sure many of you do this. It's just this is what we do at the Royal. We do have a mentoring system for new members. Buddy them up with one of our, our, our senior members. 
Uh, I don't really get involved. I just suggest maybe this is what, what it should look like, as in go to this person just to see whether your review is, is appropriate. And it seems to work. I think people seem to um, like that approach. Learning from other HRECs. Now, I'm a member, I'm a chair of two and a member of Townsville, the chair of the UQ Committee A, and I'm a member of Townsville. I have sat on another couple of committees, UQB, for example. I've also visited another couple of committees. And I think one of the ways to learn, apart from having this conference, is actually to visit other ethics committees. Um, meeting with other HREC chairs and deputy chairs, well, we've done that for the last two years. Just checking time, plenty of time. Um, and that's worked well, but this is another opportunity to do so. And tomorrow, if you have the opportunity, uh, listen to the HREC chair panel and ask them some questions, because I think that's a great way to learn. In terms yeah, of quality assurance... Just to leave some time for questions. We've got quite a few questions. That's fine, Andrew. We'll get, we'll get there. Um, OK, quality assurance I wanted to mention, just because I think it's important uh, that um, an ethics committee maybe looks at an application from another committee. So I have... Uh, what I did in, actual, in one instance was one application was reviewed by our own committee. I gave them it back three months later. And it's not that I got different comments. I just got a lot more comments, right? Um, because I think if you only give it three reviewers and the rest of the committee don't read it, but then you put it upon them to read the whole application, then you will get different comments. So that's important. Now, I'm just going to scoot on a bit. Um, but what I wanted to say, though, was that ethics is part of a research continuum. Right? It's not something that we just do towards the end of, of the process. This can influence what occurs. It can influence what we get. And one of the principles I didn't put on there at the beginning was we're not there as a rubber stamp to approve rubbish applications. You know, we don't want to do that. We shouldn't be approving rubbish applications. We should be rejecting them um, if they're bad enough. But we have an opportunity to influence at an early stage what happens. And therefore, ethics should be seen as a, a, an integral part of the research continuum. Now, we have our own ethics and governance clinics. And these are, are really important because we offer researchers the opportunity on a Tuesday and Wednesday morning to come and sit down with ethics and governance, go through their application, what are the ethical implications, what are the governance implications, and Rebecca, the research governance manager, will talk about contracts and agreements and budget. All of these things are really important. But you know what? It still comes to ethics and gets approved. It still goes to governance, and then we still have to do all the, the haggling of, of contracts and, and collaboration agreements. Clearly, uh, it's not working properly. Right at the bottom there, the last dot point, opportunity for parallel review. Really important to offer that. But once again, if you rubbish in, rubbish out. If you don't get a good product in the first place, you're not going to get a good product out. So to cut to the chase, how can we manage this? One is, uh, is using consumers. And there was this wonderful paper about a practical approach to using consumers effectively. My view is that Although ethics committees do a great job, we should have a consumer view as well to determine whether that research is appropriate um, for the demographic that the research is, is aimed at. If we don't get that view, we're not doing the right thing. We'll never get the, the, uh, the, the, um, the right outcome. Um, I'll put up a link to this paper, but what it does have is four tiers of community involvement uh, in, in research. One in uh, receiving project updates, one in document revision, uh, one in participating in research project design, and one in committee participation. So I think this is a wonderful blueprint for, for any organisation that wants to actually take consumer involvement in research seriously. And as a hospital that's just been audited as part of the Safety and Quality Commission's um, clinical trial governance framework thing, um, I think this is where we should be going sooner rather than later. Okay, putting it all together then, what we're trying to do, or at least what we're conceptualising here and working towards, it is something that looks uh, uh, like, well, like this. How to improve research and research applications. Because if I put together what the Ethics Committee does and then what um, the ethics and governance clinics do and then the consumer input, you start to get a picture of boy, where you can actually influence research to start with. So this is conceptualized as the following. If you start with the idea and then are able to influence the ethics and governance aspects at that time, and then take it to the methodology group, which of course has the expertise in whatever methodology um, uh, the research is about. Add to that 
your biostatistical input, your health economics input, because let's face it, if we're working in a health system, we need to have health economic input. We need to know how much these things are going to cost, how much they're going to save, because this is a holistic approach. <clears throat> we have legal input at the same time, and we have consideration of translation and implementation. And once it's been through that, we can actually get the budget and contract stuff done. Then it can come to our ethics committee and the governance. Now, this isn't new. To a certain extent, this has been done in the UK. Any clinical trial that wants to get funding from the National Institutes of Health Research has to go through this process. So I've just, um, with, with the help of some others, adapted this for a scheme that we can actually use. So um, Sonia Hancock and uh, um, any other research governance people that are listening and any other ethics people that are listening, Think about this as a holistic exercise. It's not just about what happens at our ethics committee. How can we influence this? How can we influence research to get the outcome we require? And I believe it's by doing something like this. So this is a holistic approach, which uses a methodological center, if you like, to get a schmick application that deals with all of those aspects that the NHMRC will talk about. And I can almost guarantee within the next five years, the NHMRC will be saying, we won't give you money until you've been through this, until you can demonstrate you've got consumer input, until you can demonstrate you've got all of these other lovely things, uh, because that's how research is going. Money is going to become tighter. So I would suggest get on board because better to do it now than later. Now, uh, I'm going to stop there, Andrew, just to say though, no matter how good you are, you'll always get complaints, and there's a few issues around complaints. Um, you know, it'll never, you'll never keep everyone happy, but utilitarian principle, the greatest good for the greatest number, Jeremy Bentham lives. <laughs> I will stop there, Andrew. Thank you very much. You're more, bro. That's great, Gordon. An excellent, um, succinct summary of where you think we should go in relation to how we organize ourselves. And there's lots of questions. Um, I'll just capture some of them and then maybe you could follow them up afterwards. Well, just Gary, uh, Gary's talk is going to be reasonably short, so, so don't worry if you, if you go over by a few minutes. Okay. Um, so uh, Ben Canny's just made a comment. Any barrier inhibits the cultural change and acceptance required, which was a response to one of your comments. Uh, but then there was a few questions about whether you were talking about uh, what people have called regular risk or low risk. And I think you were talking about all research, weren't you? All yeah, research. This, isn't, this isn't clinical trials. This is this is all research. You can apply this to all research. But specifically, let, let's just say it was. Let's just say you did this for clinical trials, and and you're not going to get money in the UK if, if your clinical trial doesn't go through this process. Mm -hmm. I would like this to be agnostic, you know, for research. I don't think we should uh, um, um, make it specialised because let's face it, it's a it's a didactic process as well. We want people to learn through this process, and and so. Um, you know, you shouldn't just say low risk or more than low risk. It should be all research. Yep. And that leads to the next question, which is from an anonymous attendee. How do you meet the national? I know what you're going to answer, but I'll ask the question. How do you meet the national statement requirements? Of, of what? If you, uh, It's related to high risk research. Oh, it'll always be. Oh, then, it'll always be the follow on question is to review high risk research using a full committee with an out. Are you talking about? to re reviewing high-risk research using a full committee with an out-of-session review of applications. Yeah, well, look, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a full committee, in a full committee program, um, uh, members only have to have had the opportunity to review it and make their comments. So yeah. if all members have made their comments, that comprises a review. Um, that's not to say, of course, that uh, it, will, it will be approved because some of the members may disagree. But once again, all ethics committees are about consensus. And if I have a, uh, uh, an ethics committee, which normally has 20 members, and I only have eight because that's quorum, and those eight people agree, well, you know what? That's less than half, but that's still consensus and quorum. So good to go. Next one. Um, on this comment on, on the moustache, of course. <laughs> Um, I might have understood this is an anonymous one, uh, but why would a chair only assign an application to three reviewers? Should it not be reviewed by the entire committee comprising of researchers, lay members, pastoral care, a lawyer, care counsel, and treatment members? Well, as, as, as I probably answered in the last question, members only have to have had the opportunity to review it and make their comments, and they do that at the meeting. So everyone has the opportunity, but of course, at a meeting, what I do is I would, for example, give it to um, a lay member, 
uh, a care and counselling member and a researcher member who works in that research. So you have, and, and I, I review them all as well, by the way. So now you have four, four reviews and then all other members have the opportunity to say yes or no or to make their comments. So it always comes to the meeting. If we do it out of session, it doesn't make any difference because it would just be an electronic meeting as opposed to uh, a, you know, a Zoom meeting. Yeah. And the final couple of questions, somewhat, uh, Sylvia went and said that was inspiring. Um, and so Thanks. you've done well there. And um, uh, the trial in six days was very proud of our members from Michelle Matz the, with quick reviews. So quick reviews are possible. And I guess the, the concerns around the edges are from people um, as long as it still is a robust review. And I think that you, you're, you would support that notion. Well, look, look, absolutely, Andrew. And I suppose if I, just, if I just reiterate, we're in a trajectory where we can decrease time. Our job is to try and get business days and clock days as close together as possible, you know, as, as little as possible. And we can do that because if we actually work with researchers you know, beforehand, rather than sticking them with a, a list of 50, 50 questions, now we don't actually go to 50 questions, fortunately, or oh, quite close actually, once. Um, but if we actually sort this out beforehand, before it even comes to the ethics committee, you know what, that's gonna be a pretty damn quick review. And we're only constrained by our imagination here. Like yeah. we, we do things the way we do them because we don't know any better. But if you look at Tanya Simons' talk yesterday about reimagining consent, you know, it's a really wonderful talk. Um, and uh, Brent Richards this morning, these are talks that show that we're only constrained by our lack of understanding of technology or the use of data. And so, you know, we're going to try this. We're going to we're going to test this with five or six applications and see how we go. Uh, and, you know, happy to happy to, you know, happy to let you know what the results are. And maybe, you know, we should be looking at a process of um, someone suggested this chairs and other people, governance people getting together and actually working through the ways we can do things better. Look, that's a great idea. And what I would suggest is uh, work through, like, do the uh, you do the pilot testing and then, you know, maybe have a sort of focus group after that, because then we can actually find out what the barriers were. And it's so important to involve the right people in this process. But bear in mind, this isn't just about ethics. It's not just about governance. This is a holistic approach. And I can see Gary online, and I'm sure Gary's going to give me a nod. Well, then that will get the communities in there. Okay. Um, Thank you, Gordon. Very interesting presentation.